Hello, uh, welcome back. I now want to dive a little bit deeper into our second fundamentally nonlinear behavior, which was that of uh, regions of attraction. Remember, before we talked about this disease spread with a track, a track and trace system or a test and trace system, where we were trying to quickly chase down infectious individuals and isolate them before they could spread the disease through a population. Um, but if um, that tracing, uh, we had some finite tracing capacity, so we've only got a limited number of people who are able to make phone calls and so on. If the number of infections gets too large, the system gets overwhelmed and, um, and uh, an epidemic will ensue anyway. Um, so I just want to give you a, a few more uh, details about this model. We're not going to really get into the nitty-gritty of how to model these things. As we said before, this is not a modeling course. But we have made these simple um, Simulink demos. Um, so just to give you a few more of the details behind those demos so that you can go and simulate um, this system for yourself and experiment a little bit with this um, behavior of a, a region of attraction. So what uh, goes into this um, epidemic uh, model with uh, test and trace. Well, we have four distinct populations. And then I'm going to put a D and an R here. And they're supposed to, you have a population of people who are being exposed to a disease and they must belong to one of these four categories. So S, these are the people who are susceptible to the disease. So if it's a new disease, your entire population may be uh, susceptible. And then we have two categories corresponding to people who are infectious with the disease. And these are sort of two different stages of infection. So IR, these are the, the, this is the first stage of infection. People are infectious, um, but they don't know they're infectious. And in fact, our test is not effective at identifying this group. Uh, when they've had the disease for a little bit longer, they um, start to display symptoms that can be picked up by the test. So they become discoverable. So if we go and test these people, we'll find out that they are infectious and we'll be able to isolate them. And then the final group, um, uh, is people who have had the disease, they've now recovered. Um, and so the progression of the disease takes you from here to here to here to here. And the rates at which people go through these different groups, um, I mean, you typically, this is called a compartmental model, and it's quite common to denote rates as values above arrows. We don't need to get into the details, but um, here we have a beta, an S, and then an I. R plus I D. And this rate is uh, modeling the rate of infection. And you see there's a multiplication between the number of susceptible people and the number of people who are infectious. So this is supposed to capture the behavior of infectious people and susceptible meeting. And as they meet um, with some probability, um, they will pass on the disease to a susceptible person. And so someone who was susceptible then becomes infectious in the first stage. And then in addition, we have two other rates that take us between these um, final stages. And this is just saying that people in this kind of freshly infectious stage move to the discoverable stage with some rate alpha and similarly from discoverable to recovered. The details aren't so important. I mean, I always encourage you to go away and read more and try and learn more about modeling. Um, but we're more interested in this course in understanding behaviors of models. Um, so in some sense, this model is given to us. And when we write this in differential equation form, what this means is that we have s dot i r dot i d dot and r dot is equal to and then we add in a term for each one of these transitions so our first transition is people who were susceptible becoming um, infectious in this early stage of infection and they do so with rate beta s I R plus I D. Then our second one um, takes us from 
this early stage to this discoverable stage. And here we have a one and a minus one and a zero and an alpha i r. And then we have another term for this final stage, which takes us, ah, that's a minus one, that's a plus one, which takes us from discoverable to recovered with rate gamma i. And so this, at the moment, there's no test and trace being implemented here. So this is just a model for disease spread, and we're, we can go and simulate what would happen. And um, so again, if we draw time here, and then we could have percentages. So this is showing the percentages of various parts of our population, and we can simulate what happens for various di different initial conditions. So. Here we actually notice straight away this is in our standard state space form where this thing here, this is our state vector, so x dot is equal to some big function of SIRID um, or equivalently said some function of our state. We have no inputs, so this is of the form f of xu. We have a nonlinear model and we're just free to simulate it for various initial conditions. So, for example, we could investigate what would happen if originally, so at time t is equal to zero, 99% of our population is susceptible, 1% have entered this first stage of the disease, and then we have no one in uh, the other stages. And based on this, we can um, just simulate what happens and we get something that looks like this. So I'm not gonna put all the curves on, but we end up with a curve, something like this for S of T. So we see as time progresses, the susceptible population drops. And this is happening because lots of people who were susceptible, they get the disease they go through this process and eventually they recover, but once they've recovered, they're no longer susceptible. And to put one more curve on, so initially the IR population is at 1%, and it actually undergoes some, like, that you have this sort of characteristic bell here, so this is IR of T. And you can go and compute all of the others um, as well if you want. Um, and so you see this is like our outbreak, and I guess you may have even seen curves like this in the news or on social media or kind of all over the place. Um, and so this, initially we have a very small number of infectious people, then we get a big uh, epidemic, and then it dies down again once everyone's been exposed to it and you reach this so-called herd immunity uh, condition. So that's fine, uh, but we want um, to investigate test and trace. So let's try to include that in our model. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace, so we're going to replace um, this rate with this. We're going to keep the beta, we're going to keep the s, and here we're going to have ir plus id. So at the moment nothing has changed, this is exactly equal to this. And now let's just try to remember roughly what was going on here. So we said new infections were caused by susceptible people meeting infectious people, that's why it was s multiplied by all the infectious people. But now we're saying that we can discover people with test and trace and remove them from our population. So our a very naive and probably unrealistic way to model test and trace would be to put a minus min id c uh, in here. So, so what does this mean? Well, this min, it just takes the minimum of these two numbers. So what it says is that as long as id is less than some number c, we'll subtract id. So in words, as long as we're less than our test and trace capacity, so this is like our capacity, if someone is discoverable, we discover them and we remove them and we stop them spreading um, the disease in the population. However, if ID gets bigger than our capacity, we just remove 
C instead. So we remove as many as we can, but that might not be all of the discoverable people out there. And uh, this sort of would roughly capture the effect of a test and trace system where there's some capacity um, involved. So what happens if we simulate this model instead? Um, well, we'll take the same initial condition. And what happens now? So we'll put our 100% on. And as before, the susceptible population, it starts just below 100. But now, basically nothing happens. S of t more or less remains constant. And this is indicating that our uh, test and trace system is working. We're, we're pulling people out so fast that we're able to keep the number of infectious and susceptible interactions very low, and the disease doesn't manage to spread. And if you plot the ID curve, it starts at 1% and um, goes something like that. And I, I should say that this all depends on what the capacity is. So we're, we're assuming here that our capacity is quite a bit larger than 1%. Um, but now what happens if we start with a different initial condition? Um, so let's start with the initial condition x0 may be equal to 90. 10, 0, 0, so we have a bigger initial outbreak. But let's say 10, 10 is still below our capacity. So that we've got something like that and something like that. Well, this time things revert more or less to exactly the open loop um, behavior, so with the behavior without test and trace. So this time, S of t. So lots and lots of people end up catching the disease and we get the same characteristic lump in our IR curve. Um, and this is illustrating exactly this uh, region of attraction behavior. Just for, by scaling the initial condition, we get completely different behaviors. And before we had something that was very stable and very nice and working very well, um, but it got overwhelmed. And actually, this is very common. No, I mean, this, um, in this example, we've been looking at disease spread, but given any system, typically whatever actuators you have will be subject to some constraints, like motors are not infinitely powerful, um, this kind of thing. So there will always be this saturation um, going on. And so then if you have a process that's inherently unstable, if you get pushed far enough away, your actuators get overwhelmed and you see the full unstable behavior um, happen anyway. And very uh, finally, very quickly, I guess you can already see this. So why is this a fundamentally nonlinear behavior? and not a linear behavior, well, it follows from exactly the same scaling property that we investigated last time. If this system was linear and we scaled our initial condition up like we did here, the output would have to be scaled similarly. So if the system was linear and this was a solution for one initial condition, if we made the initial condition 10 times bigger, the output would also just have to be scaled by 10 times and it would have to look something like this. But it doesn't, it looks like this big bell. And this is because the system is nonlinear rather than linear.